All right. Um, so we have Eric Tupin here, and he is talking about um, backdrop CMS as a um, Drupal 7 upgrade path. And so I'll hand it over to him. Cool. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks a ton for being here or being, being there. <laughs> um, one second, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. Great. Cool. So yeah, again, thanks so much for being here. Um, I am super excited to talk a little bit about Backdrop today. Um, my name is Eric Tupin. I'm a senior developer from Atten Design Group, and I have been working with Atten Design Group for a little more than 15 years. Uh, I'm also the lead developer for Solo and SSF. That's uh, Stanford on and off campus learning opportunities and Stanford seed funding. And I have been since the beginning of those projects uh, way back in 2015. We've been partnered with Stanford's research, information technology, and innovation team um, since the beginning of these projects, again, in 2015. Let's see here. Great. So uh, today we're talking about a Drupal 7 to backdrop CMS upgrade. And I'll be using those sites that I just mentioned, uh, Solo and Seed Funding, as sort of case studies to talk about this. This is uh, Solo, Stanford On and Off Campus Learning Opportunities. Uh, this is one of the websites we'll be talking about today. You can visit this at solo.stanford.edu. And this is the other one. This is uh, Stanford Seed Funding. The other site that myself and Joel Steidel, who's the director of engineering at Atom Design Group, recently converted from Drupal 7 to Backdrop CMS. This one is at seed funding, just spelled how it sounds, .stanford.edu, if you want to take a look. So uh, things we're going to talk about today. Um, first, what is Backdrop and why you might use it? And second, uh, is Backdrop for you or for me? Then we'll talk about those case studies, the sites I just mentioned, Solo and SSF, and then a little bit about differences between Drupal 7, Drupal 9, and Backdrop, specifically um, making decisions about which platform to be on. And then finally, we'll talk about the outcome of the, <clears throat> excuse me, case studies that uh, we're looking at and the outlook for those platforms. So before diving into that, um, into that structure, I threw a slide in here, the end of the Drupal 7 world, and I just want to talk a little bit about kind of where Drupal 7 is and what this means. So Drupal 7, as I think everyone here knows, represents uh, a ton of conceptual continuity, more than a decade. And what that means is that people have been using Drupal 7, writing documentation for it, building modules for it, building extensions for it, themes for it, for super long, for more than 10 years. So it's no surprise that hundreds of thousands of organizations are still on Drupal 7. So the Drupal 7 end of life is, is imminent-ish, we think it is. Um, right now, staged for November 2023. But of course, there was also that kind of caveat that that may be extended and will be reevaluated year by year. So end of life doesn't mean, and again, I, I imagine everyone in this, in this room knows this, but uh, end of life does not mean that Drupal 7 disappears or is immediately unusable. It just means that after end of life, because there's no security support, it degrades over time um, and becomes less and less secure. So the traditional standard Drupal 7 upgrade path is just to move to a newer version of Drupal. That's eight, nine, or 10, uh, right now it'll be nine. And that is a rebuild. So it's not a true upgrade. You'd be rebuilding the platform in Drupal 9. That means complete backend rebuild, complete front end rebuild. So it's kind of like building your website uh, from the beginning. The only thing you actually bring into the new project from the old project is whatever technical context you have about how it works or how you want it to work. So uh, what I'd love for everyone to kind of keep in mind for this presentation is, um, is that truly feasible? Uh, a complete rebuild for your site. And I think for a lot of people it is. I think that a lot of folks have uh, allocated funds, a team, et cetera. 
Um, and then beyond that, if there was another option that was dramatically more economic um, with no real kind of negative end, would that be desirable? Would it be worth considering? So back to this structure uh, that I talked about in the beginning, let's take a real quick look at what is backdrop and why you might use it. Um, so I'm going to be positioning backdrop as an economic option for a Drupal 7 upgrade. Um, I'm not a core or contrib contributor. I'm not really associated with backdrop. I did just have some really successful projects using backdrop, which is why I'm real excited about it. Um, if you leave this presentation and don't remember anything else that I said, the thing to remember is that you can spend a fraction of an estimated rebuild cost to just upgrade to backdrop from Drupal 7. Um, a lot of folks, when they hear backdrop, think of something like maybe this is something uh, new, a new CMS that's here specifically to deal with end of life issues. Not really the case. Backdrop has been around since 2015. Since then, it has been a viable, secure, and innovative platform uh, specifically committed to a direct upgrade path from Drupal 7. Um, when I say viable, I mean that if you have a Drupal 7 website, it's going to work in backdrop CMS. There's just no real question about that. Secure backdrop CMS is supported. They have their own security team. They've been supported since the beginning of the project uh, with their own security team since the beginning and uh, have plans for that for the foreseeable future. Um, innovative backdrop isn't just like a version of Drupal 7 that's not going to die. They have made really significant innovations, a lot of new development. Um, configuration completely revamped. There is a very cool configuration and code system. Caching completely revamped. Uh, backdrop CMS runs without any special configurations. Backdrop compared to Drupal 7 runs around 35% faster. Uh, there's also a new layout builder. So display suite was put into core uh, and that kind of became this layout builder, which is really cool and really flexible. Backdrop CMS is a fork of Drupal 7. So that just means that, uh, you know, if there are already non-developers in the room, um, way back in 2015, somebody made a copy of Drupal 7 and have been working on it and kind of evolving it on its own path since then. So Drupal 7 kind of went in one direction and Backdrop went in another. Um, in a lot of ways, it went towards a more modern uh, architecture and has implemented a lot of things that are very similar to Drupal 8, 9 and beyond. Um, Backdrop is really like philosophy heavy. They are specifically looking to solve some, some, uh, some problems like this upgrade problem, like also making a platform available to folks that don't have a massive budget and also to intermediate and beginning developers. So primarily Backdrop is built for folks that, that build websites and build websites without coding. So a lot of uh, clicking around and installing modules, et cetera. After that, their second priority is contributors. So folks that build modules and extensions and their last priority, this is all stated on their philosophy page, uh, is core contributors. So core kind of does the work uh, behind the scenes to make sure the core team does the work behind the teams to make sure that it's easier for everyone else. Some other pieces from that philosophy page, which is definitely worth checking out that I thought were applicable to this uh, presentation. Um, absolutely committed to backwards compatibility for Drupal 7. Easy to learn, secure, and like I mentioned before, fast. Faster than Drupal 7, competitive, or faster than Drupal 9, depending on what kind of sites you're running and what kind of caching you're using. Um, another thing to mention, real important from the get-go, is that Backdrop is super small compared to Drupal. Actually, that does apply in terms of code footprint. Didn't really think about that, but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, community-wise, they're much smaller community than the Drupal community. So since the beginning, they've had between 100 and 150 uh, core contributors, 100 and 150 contrib contributors and a total community of folks that are involved in messing around with the code of between four and 5,000 members, um, which is real small compared to Drupal. Uh, similar, same kind of galaxy as Drupal compared to WordPress, for example. So backdrop compared to Drupal is like 500 times smaller and Drupal compared to WordPress is like 400 times smaller. Um, backdrop is supported. It's PHP 8 ready out of the box right now. And the current version is supported to 2025. And the goal for backdrop version two is again, point and click upgrade. So no real uh, migration process or rebuild process. 
So is backdrop CMS for me? I, I think of this slide kind of like a funnel, right? So uh, we start at the top and kind of move down to the bottom. And it, as these apply to you, we keep going. <laughs> so if you're on Drupal 7, I think backdrop is worth considering. If you don't have an existing and funded plan to move to eight or nine, then I think it's, it's a very good idea to look at it. If you like your website already, if you like the way it's working, if you're satisfied with the features and you don't really want to move off of it, it's an excellent candidate. That really puts you right square where Backdrop works best for you. And then finally, if you or your development team, partners, vendors, whoever's working on the code of your website is willing to work in Backdrop CMS, I'd say that's a go ahead. That means you know extremely worth considering. Um, a little hint there. So if you can code in Drupal, you can code in Backdrop. There's, there's, a, there's a tiny bit of a curve of changes and there's an opportunity to do more like Drupal 8, 9 style programming if you would like to. Um, but if you know Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, 9, 10, you can absolutely work in Backdrop CMS as a developer. So in, in talking to some of the Backdrop folks, um, one thing that seems to be clear is that the greatest gains for a Drupal 7 to Backdrop CMS upgrade are at the two ends of the spectrum. So if you have a real, real simple site, out of the box theme, not a lot of customizations there, uh, core modules, contributor modules that are super well supported, um, you know, not a development team, somebody kind of clicking together to make a, a website work, the upgrade is gonna be super fast. We're talking uh, minutes, hours to days, depending on how complex your, uh, your site is. So if you have a custom theme, theme upgrade is technical and you'll need someone, a developer who understands theme development um, to convert your theme to backdrop CMS. But if you have an out of the box theme, there may be a version for it already, or you may be willing to just choose another one from backdropcms.org slash themes. In that case, again, we're talking about minutes, hours, days. Um, actually, something that I'll, I'll mention briefly about the, the theme here. Um, Backdrop CMS has completely revamped the theme, the theme system. And so there is no direct upgrade for a Drupal 7 theme to a Backdrop theme. That said, again, for developers in the room, uh, Backdrop still uses a very similar approach. So all of the, the TPL, the template files still work, node templates, page templates, all that stuff. And so it's really more about shifting around the work you've already done, not rewriting from scratch like you would in Drupal 8 or 9 using Twig and the new theming system. Um, okay, so at the other end of the spectrum, real complicated websites, uh, websites that are highly customized, tons of custom code, lots of contrib modules. Um, in this case, because all of that complication represents so much time in rebuilding, while it's a pretty complicated thing still to convert to backdrop CMS with all that custom code and all those customizations, it is dramatically cheaper than rebuilding. Um, so again, this is going to be slower than those kind of simple uh, processes that for a simple website, you may have to convert some contributed modules that don't yet exist in backdrop. You're going to have to refactor your custom code. There's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, and like I mentioned before, your theme's not going to come over. And so you absolutely need to convert your theme. Um, there are a couple of approaches there. There's doing it the best way using the backdrop CMS layout system, which like I mentioned before, super cool and flexible. Um, if you don't want to spend a ton of resources there, you can also do a kind of quick economic approach where you continue to use your old templates from Drupal 7. Um, there's some tricks to just kind of make that work. Okay, so we talked about what is Backdrop. Um, it's a fork of Drupal 7. It's a small community, robust software that is viable, innovative, and secure. Is Backdrop for you? I think if you have a Drupal 7 website, it's absolutely worth looking at. Um, and then if you have a really complicated Drupal 7 website and you're worried about rebuild costs, that really makes you a perfect candidate. So let's talk about um, the websites that I mentioned earlier. Let's see here. So um, the way that I'd like to do this, if you visit those sites, I, I, I mentioned earlier, solo.seed, or sorry, solo.stanford.edu and seedfunding.stanford.edu. If you visit them, you can, you can take a look at kind of the front end. There's some opportunities and about page, but there's not a ton to look at. And unless you're a uh, Stanford faculty or a student, in which case you can log in. 
Um, but there's not a ton to look at for, for regular non-Stanford folks. And so what I'm going to do is show a couple of slides that talk about the back end. And what I'm really trying to demonstrate here is the complexity of these sites. We've been working on them for, for seven years, constant development, super complicated platforms that accomplish some really interesting things. Um, to make this work, I'm going to autoplay these slides um, and then kind of talk through some of the features of the site as I do that. The screens that we're going to be looking at are screens of um, a user called a program officer, who is someone who would be offering an opportunity at Stanford uh, to students or to faculty. So it's students on, this, on the solo side and faculty on the seed funding side. An opportunity for students would be an opportunity to study, to travel abroad, to be an intern, something they have to apply for to receive funding to do these things. And an opportunity on the faculty side is research grants for uh, Stanford's research programs, which are you know, some of the biggest in the US. Um, to receive funding for research. So let me turn this autoplay on. And hopefully that works. So uh, like I mentioned before, we've been working on these platforms for seven years. We have a sprint style where we release new features every month to two months. The longest break we've taken is three months. I'll touch, touch on that a little bit longer uh, in a second here. Um, these platforms facilitate complex application management workflows that were developed specifically for Stanford faculty, Stanford staff, and Stanford students. Highly customized, more than 60 contributed modules used, nearly 40 custom modules that we built ourselves, two custom uh, API integrations, one that brings over faculty data like research interests and professional specifications from Stanford to attach automatically to, to applications, and another one that connects with MAIS, that's middleware and integration services, uh, to pull over student records that can be attached to their applications like GPA, uh, academic career, et cetera. All these sites use, or both these sites use SSO, so single sign-on using Stanford's proprietary style uh, SUNET login that also brings over data about who the user is and how they should interact with the site. Uh, the sites include complex on-the-fly PDF rendering. So imagine if you're a program officer and you're collecting dozens or hundreds of applications and you've made these custom forms and you're collecting all this custom data, then to send that off to reviewers to review that application, you can download them all as automatically rendered PDFs in these large packets that you can then send off to your reviewers to review. Um, you can also choose which applications are in those packets. There's a lot of options there. These platforms include five distinct user roles. It's actually more than five, but I'm only going to mention five. Um, that's program officers who create the opportunities, applicants who fill out the forms and apply to be considered, um, reviewers who is a third party or, or various third parties, could be 10, 15, 20 people that you send your applications off to and you create a custom review rubric where they can use that to fill out to uh, uh, evaluate those applications. Student program officers, which would be if a program officer recruits some students to help them manage some of these tasks, uh, and recommenders, who would be a third party that submits like letters of recommendation or other assets to recommend applicants. There's also a completely customizable notification system with dozens of notifications that are uh, appear as dashboard notifications and also designed HTML emails that tell people your application was submitted, it's being reviewed, we have questions, can you submit additional materials? All sorts of these notifications just to sort of push these workflows along um, and get to the end of the process. The platforms have more than 18,000 Stanford users. We've offered since the beginning more than 1,000 opportunities. Um, and we have as many as 20,000 visitors a month uh, or 275,000 pages served. Um, let's see if I can get to the end of this piece. There we go. Great. So the reason that I walked through all of that is really just to um, help clarify and qualify what I mean when I say a complex Drupal 7 website. And here's what we're talking about where you can really realize the most dramatic savings, not just in, in money, but just time too, in order to get over to a new functioning website. So let's talk a, a little bit about how you might make some decisions around Drupal 7, uh, Drupal 9, and Backdrop. So 
Um, I'm going to mention this again in a second, but when we made this decision to, to uh, switch to Backdrop, we were actually only considering Drupal 9 and Backdrop because at the time, the end of life extension had not happened. And so we really needed to move, or we thought we really needed to move off of Drupal 7. In retrospect, I still think that moving to Backdrop was the right decision. Um, this is more like a, I guess, a project management or resource management thing. But the difficulty I think that Drupal 7 is facing right now, or at least in my projects that are still in Drupal 7, is just that limbo is very hard to endure. And when you don't know when the site is not going to be supported, um, it can be very difficult because, you know, clients have certain times, fiscal years or whatever, where they have the money, they have the resources. And if the end of life doesn't match that rhythm, it can be real difficult to figure out if you're going to be able to make the change when you need to. So anyway, that said, some uh, a little more information about Drupal 7. So as I mentioned earlier, um, core support until November 2023 and uh, maybe beyond. Good contrib support. Uh, the difficulty here is that a lot of folks that built and maintain Drupal 7 modules have moved on to Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. And so they may not be putting as much attention into keeping their Drupal 7 modules up to date or responding to input there. Um, wide industry support for Drupal 7, uh, just meaning there's tons of developers that can work on Drupal 7 sites. But at least from my anecdotal personal experience, if you're talking to anyone about Drupal 7, their first questions are going to be, what's your next move? Like Drupal 7 is kind of by definition something you need to move off of. There's also a little bit of risk, I would say a high risk of PHP 8 compatibility, especially if you have a lot of older custom modules. Um, something I didn't mention earlier, the PHP 7 end of life is also coming up, which is kind of tied in with Drupal 7 in the sense that Drupal 7 relies quite a bit um, on PHP 7 especially if it's custom modules that somebody built a while ago and have no longer or are, are no longer maintained. Um, the outlook for Drupal 7, uh, the outlook is, is the next version of Drupal. If you're on Drupal 7, I think you're just waiting for news and then need to change eventually. And then, you know, one thing that would be kind of an upshot, obviously, is you don't have to do anything. If you have a complex site and you're worried about cost to rebuild, if you just stay on Drupal 7, as long as you do that, there's, there's no action required. There's no cost. Okay, so uh, Drupal 9 is the traditional move. Um, Long-term support, extremely well-defined roadmap to future versions. Um, at Atten, we've done dozens of Drupal 9 builds and upgrades. Um, and I am in no way saying that backdrop CMS is always the right answer. Um, it certainly is in some cases, uh, but Drupal 9 is the traditional move. There is wide and innovative industry support. What I mean there is that the folks who are in the Drupal world are excited about new versions of Drupal. They're making new modules, new themes. So there's lots going on there. And if you want to hop into a CMS and just pull a bunch of modules and you know, stick them together in the GUI without doing a lot of code work, out of the box, there's a ton of stuff working for Drupal 9, Drupal 10, and it's going to keep growing. So the outlook here too is really what is really good. Uh, Drupal 9 upgrades more or less seamlessly to Drupal 10. Um, and those upgrades should continue like that for the foreseeable future. And then, you know, another thing to consider here, a big one is that if you're gonna move to Drupal 9 and you're currently in seven, it's a complete rebuild. Uh, front end, back end, everything that you have done uh, gets set aside and you start from the beginning. And actually, interestingly, speaking from experience, um, if you do not have really robust testing in place for complex platforms, one of the big risks of rebuilding is that people on the team may not actually have 100% context of what all the features are. And so what can happen is you can rebuild your site and literally everyone forgot about feature X or feature Y. And then a month or two down the road, a user is like, hey, what happened to feature X or feature Y? And you're like, oh my gosh, we built that like six years ago. Um, so there's, though, that's also a, a thing to worry about a little bit with uh, Drupal 9. Okay, and then backdrop CMS, uh, long-term support, um, right out of the box support until 2025, a well-defined roadmap for beyond 2025. There's a roadmap page on the uh, backdropcms.org site that you can take a look at. Um, the goal for backdrop 2, which is staged for release, uh, quote, sometime after January 2025, the goal for Backdrop 2 
is point and click upgrade, much like uh, Drupal 7 to Backdrop 1. So the Backdrop community is far smaller than Drupal's, like I mentioned earlier, and that implies some drawbacks. So industry support is one of those. Um, you, know, you may think that it would be more difficult to find developers in a smaller community. Um, innovation may also be difficult because if it's a smaller community, then you're not having, you don't have you know, hundreds of thousands of people working on building new modules and new themes every day, you'd have a few thousand people. Um, so this has some specific ramifications, I think. One is that there's kind of a, I'm not sure what the right term is. There's kind of a shock. Like if you ask people that have never heard of Backdrop, hey, can you work in Backdrop? The obvious answer would be no, if they've never heard of it. But if they're Drupal developers, the answer is actually yes. So if you ask me, do I work in WordPress? I know that I don't work in WordPress. Uh, I'm a developer. I've been one for a super long time. I could probably learn WordPress in a couple of months and, and you know, do some passable work there. But my expertise is Drupal. So when people hear Backdrop, they may think that it's a similar dynamic and be like, oh, no, I, I don't know that. But really, if they're a Drupal developer, they know 90% of Backdrop already. And so really, there's not that huge problem of the community being small, because if you know any Drupal developers, they can absolutely work in Backdrop. And they can kind of choose which way they want to work in Backdrop, because the old Drupal 7 style of developing is still available. The hook system is still around. And the newer object-oriented uh, Drupal 8 style of programming is what all the new Backdrop stuff is built in. So they could also choose to work that way. So it's actually widely available to Drupal developers. Innovation is, is another thing here. So you know, there's, there's not tons and tons, at least compared to Drupal, um, of people releasing new modules for Backdrop CMS every day. However, the conversion process in some cases is so simple, it's not even, you can't even really consider it a conversion. That's not the case always. Uh, some can be pretty complex. But for example, the other day, uh, I think it was last week, I needed a web form markup field. Um, and so I looked for it. I found it in Drupal. It didn't exist in Backdrop. And my conversion process was to change the line that says something about Drupal in the info file in the module and then change one line in the module. And that was it. And it was some line that it was, I don't remember clearly, but it was something like there's a lot of functions that are Drupal underscore something. And those have all changed to backdrop underscore something. Um, so in some cases, module conversions are just like you flip a few lines and you're done. Um, so in that case, while the, the, the official modules supported on backdrop cms.org slash modules, that might seem like a smaller list, but so many more are available if you, if you have somebody that can go in and make those minor changes. Um, and then also backdrop as compared to Drupal 7, Drupal 7, at least in my opinion, is, is by definition old and trying to die. The Drupal community wants it to go away as soon as they can make that make sense. Um, whereas the backdrop community is, uh, is the opposite. It is innovative. They're working on future versions. Um, it is absolutely moving forward. And the folks that work on it are excited about moving it forward. Uh, and then finally, and that's kind of what this, this whole presentation about is two huge things come away from this. One, extremely cost-effective, extremely. And the other is an extremely low risk. And the low risk is because if you have very complex data relationships in your system, all kinds of content types linked to other content types, taxonomy terms, whatever the case may be, if you rebuild, you have to migrate all that stuff and find a way to test it and make sure that those connections are still uh, intact, right? Whereas if you upgrade to Backdrop CMS, you're using the same database. There's no migration process. It's an upgrade in place. And so like your terms, if you have thousands of tags and thousands of categories, on the other end, on the Backdrop end, they have the same term ID. Your nodes have the same node ID. There's no real technical difference between the, the data structure in your old site and your new site. And there's no migration process. So you turn it on in Backdrop and all of those complex relationships just still exist. There's no migration there to worry about. Okay, um, let's talk a little about uh, outcome for these specific projects. And the goal here is just to give an idea of, of what you might be able to expect from a real complex, um, real complex conversion from Drupal 7 to Backdrop CMS. Um, so a, a little bit about the likely alternatives first. And again, I just, just want to highlight that we made our decision before the D7 end of life. And so we were considering backdrop versus Drupal 9. 
And Drupal 9 was our traditional way forward. That's what we would have normally suggested. In fact, it's what we initially suggested. Um, Zach Chandler, the director of the research innovation, uh, information technology and innovation team at Stanford was real interested in investigating other um, innovative options, right? Because he's the director of innovation, <laughs> which is why we eventually uh, looked into backdrop and, and ended up going that way. Um, so when we were thinking about what we we're gonna do with this platform uh, last year, some things we were considering, one, seven years of ongoing full-time development to build these platforms into what they are today. Uh, workflows for those application management pieces, there are seven to eight distinct workflows and each of them has dozens of feature sets uh, for sending notifications, for keeping people moving forward in the process, et cetera. Just to, to put a, another nail on this, uh, we have to use automated testing because there's so many features, there's no way we can keep track of everything that's going on uh, from day to day. We originally had a Selenium-based uh, suite of tests, thousands of tests, over 74 distinct suites. Um, and the way that works for anyone who's not familiar is that it loads a browser and it you know, loads up the website in the browser on your local machine or on a dev copy. Uh, and it actually goes through, it logs in as the user, it goes through some of their tasks, it creates an opportunity, fills out the field, submits the form, and then checks that all the markup is what it expects it to be on the following page and continues to do that. So it's, it's like a little, you know, robot script or bot script that's actually doing all the things that a human would do with the site. And running those tests, which only test around 85% of our features on a local machine where it's lightning fast and it's just going like blip, 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 blip from one page to the next, submitting hundreds of forms, just running all those tests takes 30 minutes. Uh, like it's just so many features across the site. There was so much to move. So our original estimate for this project in Drupal 9, and this is me who I know all there is to know about the project I've been involved uh, you know, since the beginning for, for seven years. And then Joel, our director of engineering, um, our original estimate was between 3,500 and 4,000 hours to rebuild in Drupal 9. Um, and that was really aggressive, I think, uh, definitely on the low end of the spectrum and assuming that I would be doing it, who knows everything there is to know about the platform and that Joel would be helping me. Um, at Atten Design Group, that level of effort between 3,500 and 4,000 hours represents a four person team working full time for five months. Okay, so we decided to go with Backdrop um, after looking into it with uh, Zach Chandler and also just spending some time kind of uh, engaging the Backdrop community. Um, and it wasn't super easy. There was so many things that came right over, so many modules, all the data structures, everything comes right over. But there was also plenty of really difficult moments because of some of the things we ran into. So um, of the 61 contrib modules that we have, 17 were not yet converted. And some of those were kind of doozies, like the encrypt module, the send grid module, there was some real complex stuff. And I remember thinking when we first started, and we tackled, of course, some of the more difficult modules first to make sure we get them out of the way. But I remember thinking in the first couple of days, like, gosh, are we going to be able to do this in the time allotted? Um, so there were absolutely difficult moments. Of those 17 modules that we, we built, I call them preliminary versions um, because we built them for us. They're not released publicly on backdropcms.org. Uh, we built them for us. So like the encrypt module, SendGrib, whatever. We got it working for our use cases, and there may be some pieces that aren't done, so we can't really consider those converted for the community. Of those 17, about 10 right now have pioneer versions, which means that you can find them on the backdrop GitHub space, um, and they may work great for you, but they may not. And if you're a developer, you could probably figure out uh, whether it's going to work for you or not. <laughs> um, we also converted, of course, all of our custom modules, 38 custom modules. Uh, context, which, which was a really big thing in Drupal 7 uh, for deciding what content goes on what page, was kind of blown away in Backdrop CMS, replaced by the layout system. And so we had a really heavy use of context and had to completely overhaul that system. Um, beyond making the module upgrades, beyond converting the theme, uh, there were more than 250 significant changes in the code base. And I know this because as I went through and found these, you know, just trying to run page after page and running into errors and trying to go fix it. Every time I had to rewrite some code, um, I would just put a big comment that said, uh, you know, backdrop change. And then later I went through and, and can count those um, in the, you know, code editor ID. And there was, you know, more than 250 of them. Um, another thing that I want to note here is that 
I'm a real big fan of the Backdrop CMS layout system. Um, super cool and flexible. Um, makes it really easy for non-technical users to have really cool layouts. But we didn't actually use it in this project. I think that we would like to do this in the future. Perhaps that's something we can get into next year. Um, but to get things working, we took a lightweight approach, which is something I mentioned earlier, just getting all of your old template files to work in Backdrop. So our Backdrop CMS upgrade took one and a half developers, which was me full-time and Joel uh, half-time. It took us three calendar months. So we worked on it last year, October, November, and December. And actually half of December was vacation time. So three calendar months, but uh, really 10 weeks. Um, and it took us 550 hours in total. And inside of those 550 hours, we also completed a lot of tasks that are not even related to Backdrop. Um, it's, it's important to mention that one of the biggest reasons we chose Backdrop was because if we successfully pulled it off and it was actually a lot more cost effective, it gives us plenty of room with the budget and with budget planning in the future to build new features and also to do other things that seem important to the project that we've been kind of putting off. And some of those happened right inside of this upgrade process. So we decided because it was taking so little time to do this, um, that we would go ahead and move to Pantheon, real excellent hosting solution. Um, it did require some extra work because Pantheon, uh, we have to get on an upstream, there was a, which is a, whatever, it's a, it's a code thing, but we had to kind of uh, refactor some code in order for the platform to work properly on Pantheon. That was some work. We also ended up doing the actual migration. So we migrated from legacy hosting into Pantheon, two sites, production sites, almost 20,000 users on them, quite a significant migration. And still having some extra time in our kind of foreseen budget, um, we ended up deciding that our Selenium tests, which I mentioned before, which did all the testing for us, were a little outdated and we wanted to rewrite them in Cypress, which is another really cool uh, testing suite if you ever have a chance to work with it. Uh, and so we rewrote all of our 74 testing suites, thousands of tests from Selenium into Cypress. And all of this, the complete conversion from Drupal 7 to Backdrop, uh, moving to Pantheon, working on the code base so it works in Pantheon, and rewriting all of our tests all fit inside of 550 hours. Um, so outcome and outlook, where we are today, uh, Solo and SSF launched in Backdrop CMS in January. We've been building new features since then. We've been able to get back into our sprint cycle, which is releasing new features every month or two months. Um, our platforms actually run a lot faster. This is, I think, that Backdrop and Pantheon share responsibility here. So before, we have a lot of complex workflow screens that take a little while to load, whereas the front page is pretty fast. So on average, before there was three second page loads across the board, and now there are two second page loads across the board. So a 50% performance uh, bonus. So like I mentioned before, entire upgrade, code refactor for Pantheon, migration of both platforms, and rebuilding thousands of tests in Cypress, all achieved for 15% of the estimated rebuild in Drupal 9. Um, and just want to reiterate, that's an educated estimated rebuild. That's with the, the, the primary developer, lead developer on the project helping to estimate. And our shop has done, I mean, that's all we do is Drupal work. So we've done dozens of, of Drupal 9 builds and migrations. Um, that is, well, it's almost everything I have for today. Uh, I wrote up a, a real simple kind of collection of notes about Drupal 7, Drupal 9, Backdrop CMS, and specifically how you might go about um, choosing between Backdrop CMS and Drupal 9. Uh, and if you, there's this kind of QR code thing on the screen. If you scan that, you can download that uh, document if that's helpful for you at any time. And that is everything that I have today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? If so, you can just come up to the mic. Yeah. Oh, um, can you share that QR code with us? Yeah, I just, I just realized what I did and I, <laughs> I realized my mistake. <laughs> any questions from anyone? All good. All right. I think we're good on our end. Cool. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate you taking the time and uh, have fun at the rest of your conference. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> bye, all. Bye. Everyone says bye. <laughs> <laughs>